Coming up next on Tech News Today, we got some Apple stories today, both good and bad. First, the good. Jim Dalrymple tells us all about his firsthand experience with the iPhone 7, the Apple Watch, and AirPods. The bad? Apple has a stirring problem internally with what Melanie Ehrenkranz calls a toxic environment for women. Also, New Yorkers can't help but browse for porn with Link NYC terminals and visual proof that burritos can fly. All that and more coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1599, recorded Thursday, September 15th, 2016. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Gazelle, the online marketplace for buying and selling used gadgets. Shop from a variety of certified pre-owned electronics or trade one in for cash. Give a new life to a used device. Visit gazelle.com today. And by Wealthfront. Wealthfront is a low-cost automated investment service and the most sophisticated way to invest your money. Whether you've got millions or you're just starting out, visit Wealthfront.com slash TNT and sign up to get your free personalized investment portfolio. That's Wealthfront.com slash TNT. And by Zerto, virtual replication and disaster recovery technology that gives you the confidence to keep your business moving forward no matter what comes your way. Zerto empowers you to protect and recover your IT assets, move to the cloud, and know you're ready for anything. Get a free readiness assessment for your data center at confidentcio.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. This is a show where we talk about everything you need to know right now about technology. Right now. Mm -hmm. Right then. Because mm -hmm. we're now, now. That now was then. That it's in the was past. then. This is now. Yeah. I am Megan Maroney. I'm Jason Howell. We are like the... I don't have one. <laughs> You're much better at that than the I am. The yin and yang, perhaps? Sure. Hey, that works. Yeah. I like the yin okay. and yang. That, that's actually, that's close to my heart. The yin and yang of, uh, of tech news today. That's what Excellent. we are. All right. You ready? Yep. Uh, T-Mobile warns you not to upgrade to iOS 10 if you have an iPhone 6, a 6 Plus, or an iPhone SE. CEO John Legere tweeted that there have been connectivity problems that Apple is working on fixing. So they say they'll have a fix uh, in 24 to 40 48 hours um, temporarily if you already had a problem you can power down and power back up oh turn it off turn it back on again that old mm -hmm. saw yeah so not not a great sign of course like the first hour of the update there were some brick devices but after that it was supposed to be okay mm -hmm. but now now there's some connectivity problems if you have t-mobile um yeah the other problem with iOS 10 is, uh, unfortunately, it has a. It's, fortunately, it has a great new feature where you can search for GIFs or GIFs mm -hmm. in iMessage, mm -hmm. uh, and you type in. And some people have found that typing in certain words, uh, and not even the words you might be thinking of, will bring up some uh, hardcore porn GIFs or photos. So be careful. You might not want to hand over your iPhone. I'm not uh, sure how a my little a dirty My Little Pony GIF ended up in iMessage. Like in the default iMessage GIF library is yeah. is uh, My Little Pony thing that shouldn't be there. Um, how does that get like? It almost feels like a like a, a, a an Easter egg of some sort. <laughs> like we'll just <laughs> slide in this My Little Pony GIF and no one will ever know and it'll be hilarious. Yeah. Well, apparently there's a lot of weird stuff like that going on Apple. We'll we'll talk about that later in another story. But yeah, yeah I uh, I don't know. And uh, so there's there's tons of Apple news. We'll just keep to the big stories. Um, if you have haven't ordered your iPhone 7 Plus or your Jet Black iPhone 7, do not bother waiting in line tomorrow. Apple says there won't be any available in the stores for walking customers. Uh, so too bad for you. What are the, all those people that are waiting in line? What are they going to do? They're just like there for the party, I think, at this point. I guess. Or they'll have, they can get a small gold phone or a, I mean, small. It's, you know, the, the regular 7 uh, <laughs> the or one. matte black. Yeah. Or they're not. I mean, they're just waiting in line for attention, those yeah, people. Yeah, pretty I much. Think. That's how it goes. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, at this point, we've talked the Note 7 story to death, but this bit of news deserves at least a mention, maybe a little bit more, because uh, I can't help myself. The device has been officially recalled by the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission as of their announcement earlier today. They had been working with Samsung to issue the recall for the past week, and honestly, I'm amazed it took this long, but uh, there you have it. CPSC Chairman Elliot Kay says that replacement units 
should be accessible to consumers at retail locations beginning Tuesday, September 21st. I actually just got an email right before the show from Samsung directly saying the same thing. Consumers can go to the Samsung site and enter identifiers for their device that they might already have into the site to determine if theirs needs replacing, which is likely, very likely in the U.S., as an estimated 97% of those Note 7s shipped uh, in the U.S. will require replacement from what they say. Um, you know, <laughs> I remember when this first started hitting, I was I remember saying, I think on this show that I was I was happy and, and impressed that Samsung was taking quick action. But apparently they took too quick of action and then they didn't do them because they did that. It, it led to a string of confusion. Uh, U.S. law says that Samsung should have contacted the CPSC within 24 hours of the first identified safety issue. And that's to coordinate the recall with them in an official way. They did not do this. And so as a result, you know, Samsung started issuing their things that people should be doing. And then the CPSC uh, stepped in and said, well, wait a minute, this needs to be coordinated with us and we need to be involved. So then those things that aren't working and now it's you know really super delayed so it's just kind of eh, just a situation that keeps getting worse yeah i mean they're the most popular cell phone provider in the world like this is uh shocking that they didn't really know how a recall worked yeah but i mean you know we got a dm from a viewer in south africa who said he would not have known that they were recalled if he hadn't been watching us like yeah. this was the only uh, source that he had so okay. obviously they weren't doing a really good job if they thought emailing everyone was the right thing to do I mean who checks their email anymore nobody so yeah, yeah um, or, but, or you know it's coming from like Samsung Direct it might get you know filtered off yes. into a folder that you never see or spam or whatever mm -hmm. the case may be it's I mean that's a challenge for for any business that's trying to get word out like this via email they you know you might never see it because of those filters um, Samsung apparently is offering some customers loaner devices to tide them over uh, but apparently that was that whole effort has slowed down also because of the CPSC kind of screw up they have to approve every single replacement device the CPSC does uh, in order to move this along so you know that's that's time consuming and the battery o OTA update that we talked about earlier this week I think uh, right now it's only available in South Korea and it's not you know it was slowed down again by the mishandling here in the US so no one's getting that so that's not helping so mm -hmm. It's just one thing after another that if, if they had gone the right you know direction, maybe it would be at least a little more mitigated. But I mean, it's pretty significant. So far, 92 reports of explosions, 26 reports of burns, 55 reports of property damage. If you are that one person that still has your Note 7 and you have not started this return process, I know I'm a broken record, but just do it. Save, save yourself from exploding. Mm-hmm. Well, look out, Title. Your third place spot in the music streaming race might soon turn into fourth place. By the end of 2016, Pandora unveiled a new $5 a month service today. It offers ad free listening with unlimited skips, song replays, and offline listening. The free version also got a few updates of its own. What Pandora didn't reveal was the exact date of its true on demand listening service, which is due out later this year. So, yeah, Pandora Plus is what they're calling it now instead of Pandora One. That's what they called it before. Um, they announced yesterday they'd acquired licenses from Sony Music, Universal Music, and the Merlin Network, which represents some 20,000 independent artists. So yeah, they have predictive offline mode. It can tell when you're offline and save, you, save your last few stations. So if you've ever been listening to Pandora and then you drive out of internet access and then it stops and you feel like your life is ending, that won't happen anymore. Yeah, that's one of my favorite features of just online uh, streaming in any capacity. And sometimes I, for, I forget about that. And then, you know, you end up going camping. You're like, oh, well, I have no connectivity. Let's listen to some music. And if it had been storing the stuff I've listened to in the past 20 days or whatever, or up to a certain capacity, like that's the stuff I'm most recently interested in. So it would make sense to store it. So predictive offline is, is awesome. Um, the replays feature is actually really cool too. It's basically any song that you've ever previously played is accessible to play. So it's almost like a an in between it's almost like a, a blurring the lines between the traditional pandora and uh you know traditional streaming services like spotify where you can get everything on demand if you've happened to have been presented it uh inside pandora up to that point then it's kind of on demand mm -hmm. basically so. I, lo I love Pandora. I've been a subscriber for years and I it's going to be $10 a month. So I might get rid 
of my Apple Music with subscription. The main, with, the, with the primary streaming service? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the real streaming yeah. service will be a, <clears throat> about $10 a month. No word on whether they have a family plan. That's what I have right now, $14 a month for uh, mm-hmm. my whole family. So we'll see. But I like, I mean, I like their algorithms. They've had algorithms that predict what you want to listen to for so long. And, mm-hmm. and it works for me. Um, I have simple tastes. So. Yeah. All right. What works for you? I mean, there's enough of these services, right? Everybody can find the one that works best for them. A big effort in the entertainment industry during recent years has been analyzing the representation of women in films in comparison with on-screen time of male actors. Uh, The industry, of course, is seeking to improve equity between the two. Normally, the process is very time-consuming and painstaking for the researcher to complete. Basically, they have to sit there and watch, listen, analyze, and then notate it all by hand. But the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media at Mount St. Mary's University is producing a tool with funding from Google.org to make this analysis automated. The software took two years to develop. It was aided by Google's um, advancing uh, machine learning systems that we talk about all the time. Now it allows for a 90-minute film to be completely analyzed in around 15 minutes. They say with a very high level of accuracy. Uh, Does audio and video recognition uh, with the technology? Algorithms can identify gender, speaking time, and a number of other details about the characters specifically. And yeah, this is all just kind of in an effort to, you know, bring equity to to screen time representation in a number of ways. So good tool. Yeah. AI for gender representation. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm sure someone will email me and tell me what's wrong with it. <laughs> right now, I, don't, I think we should use it for the show because I think I'm not getting enough screen time. So. Really? <laughs> Well, you got the next one. There, I'm just kidding, but it is. Uh, it it really is. Uh, it is interesting. Representation really matters. Like they, uh, I looked into um, the Gina Davis Institute, um, and tw- in 2012, girls' participation in national archery competitions doubled. In 2012, you know why? Why? Hunger Games. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> yeah, you know it was sense. like that. That makes sense. I yeah. mean, I feel like uh, emojis make a difference. Um, you know that that. You know, we recently got the new emojis before it was like girls could get their nails painted and, and get married and boys could run and ride bikes. And now, you know, now we have everything. Um, so, yeah, we should just shut up and be happy, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, they're, they're actually thinking that, you know, yes, this technology is useful in this particular you know, facet, uh, but possibly at some point to kind of open it up uh, to the sense that like, uh, you know, analyzing perceptions of computer science and engineers, we talked about that a lot on, on the show about how there aren't a whole lot, you know, there aren't a whole lot of reported uh, women in these roles. And what is the reason behind that? Is the, is the reason that they just don't like doing this type of work or is the reason that, you know, they, they have been led to believe through media representation, let's say, that this is primarily a male's kind of uh, career um, to, to get into. So they could possibly use this to analyze those types of things, representation on screen, equalize it a little bit more, and maybe that could influence change uh, in the real world. Right. Instead of people just saying, you know, like there's no, you know, women in the media um, represented as engineers. Like, you know, really? And yes, really, because here's the robot right, here's that the I proof. got that. <laughs> this <laughs> robot told me so. So yes. there we go. Well, again, this is why we cannot have nice things, people. Link NYC launched free Wi-Fi kiosks with built-in tablets in New York this year to much fanfare, but now they are sadly scaling back what they offer. Why? Because some people were using them to look at porn. Also, people were using them to watch too much Netflix and hanging out around them too much and drinking and doing drugs. And in general, they weren't really bridging the digital divide, quote, as Mayor Bill de Blasio had hoped. The kiosks are not going away yet, but they will no longer provide web browsing uh, as they look for new ways to solve these current problems. (sighs) <laughs> these, so this these, is the internet, people. Even yeah. on the streets of New York, this is just the internet. The internet does what internet does, apparently. It translates. Well, it's, it's one of those things, you know, and I'm going to edge into um, questionable territory here. But, you know, if you ever hear, hear people saying like, oh, all homeless people are, are always drunk. They're all alcoholics. They're drunk. And it's like, no, they're not. Like, they're drinking probably as much as other people, but those people are inside their homes. And so right. you can't see them. Yeah, like, right. I think this is the this same thing. could be very well <laughs> Like, you know, it's just, it's, it's like, this is what people do. And when they're out on the streets doing it, this is more of a problem of like people on the streets and income inequality. And apparently, you know, they had good intentions of putting these kiosks out there and here, like you can use this to look up jobs and things like that. And I'm sure that was happening a little bit. 
Um, and I don't even know what the statistics of uh, how many people were looking at porn on these versus right. what else they were doing. Yeah, I couldn't find that um, I, I feel like it's just maybe like someone's like maybe that that happens once and you're walking by like probably with your children and you you would probably report it. Yeah, you'd so, write <laughs> in on that probably. But, you know, it's not like, oh, everyone was just looking at porn and no one was doing anything else with them. They were outside annoying people. Um you know, as people on the street often do. And now we just like, we want to sweep them away and not look at the bigger problem. Yeah. Um, one thing that they were looking into is implementing time limitations as a, as a partial solution for this, which has me questioning why that was never implemented to begin with. Like I couldn't imagine like putting an, a, a fully un, you know, a fully accessible internet kiosk out in the middle of the street and and not having some sort of limitations like that because then, yeah, I mean, people are going to use these in crazy ways mm -hmm. if you don't kind of place some sort of restriction. I suppose it's about, though, giving access to the digital, you know, right, bridging the digital divide and maybe placing uh, time limits uh, in that regard is, is not beneficial to that effort. But I don't know. Um, it still does lots of other cool things, though, I guess. If you can't browse the web, you can still do free calls, maps, charger device, 311, 911 access, uh, Wi-Fi, uh, all remain. So at least there's that. Mm -hmm. Coming up, Jim Dalrymple from Loop Insight joins us to talk about his own experiences with the iPhone 7, the Apple Watch, and sure, why not the AirPods, too, while we're at it. But first, let's take a minute to thank Gazelle, the sponsor of this episode. Gazelle is the trusted online marketplace for buying and selling uh, used electronics. It could be how you uh, fund your next device purchase with the iPhone 7 coming out. Uh, trade in your old device for cash, buy a certified pre-owned one, or you can do both. For trade-ins, simply visit gazelle.com, find your device, and get an instant quote. Shipping is free, payment is fast, and if you're looking to buy a certified pre-owned device, Gazelle has a variety of iPhones, including the iPhone 6S and the iPhone 6S Plus, iPads, Samsung Galaxy phones, all to choose from. Each device is fully inspected. They're backed by a 30-day return policy and sold without a carrier contract. You go to gazelle.com, you see what your old device is worth, uh, check out the selections of certified pre-owned devices, and uh, Gazelle will even offers uh, financing. They'll provide financing on all devices by a firm. You simply provide your basic information, get instantly approved, and pay off in three, six, or 12 months. Easy monthly payments can be made through uh, bank transfer, check, or debit card. Just select financing with a firm at checkout uh, to look into that. Gazelle also offers a 12-month warranty for cell phones and iPads powered by Assurance Solutions. That covers water damage, cracked screens, hardware defects, and more. And of course, you have help available 24-7 uh, to process claims uh, and return your device as soon as you need to. Don't miss out on getting the best value on certified pre-owned devices. Visit gazelle.com. Uh, there are many benefits to buying pre-owned and especially doing this through Gazelle. Devices are available in good and excellent conditions. Uh, good condition shows you know, some gentle average signs of wear and tear, what you would expect, but offers consumers great prices on still great performing devices. All devices have been put through a rigorous 30 point inspection process that ensures that they're in perfect working order for when you receive it. Devices available uh, for support by major carriers, of course, AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, and Sprint. And, you know, it has all the big the big selling products right now and, and will end up getting the ones that you expect to get down the line as well. iPhone 5S, uh, 16 gig, iPhone 6, 16 gig, iPad Air, 16 gig, uh, iPad mini, Galaxy S5, Galaxy S6, all across the map. Give new life to used electronics. You can trade in for cash or buy certified pre-owned. Visit gazelle.com to find out more today. And we thank Gazelle for their support. Some of you lucky night owls will be getting your iPhone 7s tomorrow, but if you're still on the fence about the phone, the watch, or Apple's new AirPods, we thought we'd bring in Jim Dalrymple from Loop Insight, who's tried them all. Welcome back to the show, Jim. How you doing, Megan? I'm doing good. So let's start with the phone. Apple gave you a Jet Black 7 Plus to try out. First, how did that glossy goodness feel in your hand? <laughs> so I actually have two phones. I got a Jet Black uh, 7 and a Matte Black uh, 7 Plus. Oh. Yeah. So I got to try them both <laughs> and at different sizes. The, uh, the Jet Black actually looks like it'll be very slippery, but surprisingly, it's not. Hmm. Um, yeah, it 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 has a 
as not a it's not sticky, but it it feels really good in your hand. You you realize once you you put it in your hand that it's not going to just slip out, uh, even though the finish looks like it would. So you said you're sold on the jet black, um, but yes. you also had the matte black. Um, did you did you like the matte black? Was that a second place? <laughs> no, actually, matte black is first place. First oh. place all the way. Yeah, I I just the 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 matte black is so understated. Um, and I think Apple does that really well with with a lot of their things. But I just really like the finish of the matte black much better. Mm, well, good. Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm getting, but not till October, unless good. I bust into a store and you know find a fake name or something. And <laughs> who knows? Don't do that. <laughs> okay, I'll then they might I, cart I, you away. I don't know if you can. Oh, no, you, you, you ha- see that? Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. But the matte black on the the screen actually looks. Um, it, 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 when they showed it at the keynote, it actually, it kind of looked like a dull black, like almost a gray, mm-hmm. uh, but it's not. When you see it in person, it's it's black, black. It's really nice, really nice. Did they give you the, did, did they give you the jet black also, or did you have to give that one back in order to get the matte black? No, yeah. no, I have, I, I get them both at the same time. Are you allowed to show us the jet black? I actually don't have it right here with me. It's in the other room, so <laughs> I would have to get up and go get it. I'll do that. that if you no, want. no, that's okay. We uh, I, we should be surprised, right, for when we yeah, see in the store. we're a little element of surprise <laughs> yeah. here. Now the the jet black look. When I saw that on the screen at the keynote, it looked gorgeous, and because it's polished, of course, it's going to look really, really nice for those hero shots and and things like that. I just thought the the black. Um, look better and they do warn that there's going to be micro abrasions on uh the jet black finish now i I wasn't really sure what micro abrasions were uh you know your phone either scratches or it doesn't but the jet the jet black the gloss finish if you turn it to the sun will show little i guess abrasions they're not scratches so a scratch is something you know if you run your finger over it you can feel a scratch you can't feel these. Kind of like are, little swirlies or whatever. Yeah, yeah. 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 So so about. those will be there on on the jet black finish. So if that's something that you're really concerned about, you can always get the, the black mm-hmm. instead. And those, I mean, that's just like a regular a regular finish that Apple and other companies have had. It's, it's a durable finish. And I'm one that doesn't really care about the finish. I mean, I'll stick it in my pocket with a pair of keys and if it gets scratched up, you know, I don't care. Mm-hmm. But well, a lot of people do. Yeah. Uh, have you scratched it yet? The one they loaned you? No, let me see. <laughs> no, okay. no scratches. <laughs> Not <Okay>. yet. <laughs> so let's talk about the camera. Um, you know, you're, you're a music guy, not a photographer. You say this in your review. Um, how easy were those new features in the 7 Plus camera to use? You know, uh, I, I, I told Apple before that I, I suck so bad at photography that anything you can do to help me is a big plus for me because I don't think that any of us realize how much we all use our cameras now. We use them all the time taking pictures. And, you know, when when a company like Apple can come out with, with features that help you, it is wonderful. So in the review, I posted uh, a number of pictures, uh, like the ones that are on the screen right now. That's at one time. The next one is at two times. And the next one is at six times uh, zoom. So the first two are optical. That means that there's no digital things coming through uh, that could make the, the picture blurry. Those are using the lenses that are in the, the new, new iPhone uh, 7 Plus. And the third one is zoomed in uh, using digital zoom. So, you know, if you kept zooming in, maybe there would be artifacts. But I think those are pretty good pictures, especially for somebody like me that doesn't know how to take a picture. Uh, I just, I literally point and shoot. But in all of those pictures, I stood in exactly the same place, had the phone in exactly the same place, and just used the zoom uh, to, to move that. Yeah, Jim, so, there there have been a lot of, or at least there have been a, a handful of dual camera kind of approaches a lot of them on android leading up to this everybody's doing it a little bit differently would you say that the use of zoom uh, like zoom amount between the two cameras is probably the better kind of every person 
you know, makes every person happy as opposed to, I don't know, like the wide angle option or some of the other ideas? You know, I think when, when people, uh, speaking for me and, and other people like me who don't take pictures well, uh, what we want is a picture that's in focus. Yeah. And that the very simple thing on screen, it has a little circle and it says one times. You press that circle and it automatically goes to two times. It's in focus. Uh, the colors look great. That's what I want. Uh, so whatever they did works. I mean, Apple talked about doing one billion operations in the camera per what, uh, 25 milliseconds. That's all great to say. And I'm sure that photographers uh, love having that information. All I know is I was able to take pictures and be able to zoom and it looked good. So, right. <laughs> and uh, I know in your review, you said you hadn't gotten a chance to take a picture like at a show or something in yeah. low light. Have you taken any uh, nighttime pictures since you posted your review? I, I've taken some nighttime pictures and uh, they they look good. I mean, they you can see people in the, the pictures. Um, they're in focus, so it, it knows what's going on. But to me, the real test of a camera with uh, nighttime photos is going to a concert. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I'm sure that there are a lot of people out there that have tried to take pictures at a concert, and all you get from the stage, it just looks like one blob of light. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I actually want to see people on the stage. I want to see uh, the different uh, colored lights that are up there. And I don't want it to look all grainy and, and all the digital artifacts that are in there. Mm -hmm. So I know what I want. I just, you know, as a, a novice photographer, I don't know how to get there. So I'm relying on them to get me there. Sure. Mm -hmm. So uh, you also wrote that you accidentally summoned Siri a few times. What can you tell <laughs> us about that? So the, the, the iPhone 7 has a new home button. It's no longer a button as much as it is a pressure control area. So... On the old iPhone, we would actually press and hold on a, a physical button to invoke Siri. And on the new phone, because it's pressure sensitive area, I would press to unlock it. But because I was continuing to press a little bit, Siri would come up. So, you know, it took a couple of days to get used to that. And after that, it's been fine. Now I just, I, I remember to press and then let my, my thumb off a little bit because it's just not a physical button. It, it's pressure sensitive. Mm -hmm. Well, you are a musician. Uh, you are a music aficionado. Uh, what are your thoughts on the loss of the headphone jack? <laughs> you know, there, there's been so much written about the loss of the headphone jack. And um, I think it's great that the headphone jack is gone. And I think it's great not because of audio or anything else, but because it allows Apple to put other things in the phone, like opti optical image stabilization and larger battery. I mean, these are things that we need. And in order for Apple to move forward uh, with, with new technologies, space is at a premium. Something has to go or something has to shrink. A hundred year old um, headphone jack, goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> uh, you know, well, I think the mini headphone jack was done in 1964. It hasn't changed really a whole lot since. Mm -hmm. So, you know, away you go. Now, to be clear, and people have said to me, well, maybe you don't care about this because you don't have a good set of headphones. The, the in-ear monitors that I use are from Future Sonics. They, they are $800. Uh, I do have a good set of headphones. Um, the, the guy that, that made, started Future Sonics, invented in-ear monitors. They are molded to my ears. I went to an audiologist to have all this done. Then they built the headphones around these molds. I went through a lot of trouble to get these headphones made. And they are stunning in their audio quality. So I do have a good set of headphones for, for those people who, who, who think I don't. Uh, but I, I think the difference here is that when people started complaining about the loss of the headphone jack, the majority of the people uh, didn't realize that Apple would actually include an adapter. So if you have older headphones, you can still use your old headphones. You're not going to lose the use of those. The adapter is included. And they include a, a set of wired Apple earpods, the white earpods. So when I told people that, th those two things, they, they said, oh, well, what's everybody complaining about then? 
Well, that's a good question. <laughs> so your future Sonics, are they Bluetooth or do you use the dongle to listen? No, to them? dongle. Mm. I, I think my my reaction to the losing the, the headphone jack is less about the headphone jack not being there by default and more about the reliance on a dongle in the in the sense that when I have when I have a requirement of a dongle it's yet another thing to keep track of and you know say I you know depend on it being my backpack it's not there well then I'm you know I'm out of luck I almost feel like what I would probably do in this case is tape the dongle to my preferred headphones so it's always a part of that maybe they'll come up with a more elegant solution for something like that that way it's always there then you kind of get the best of both worlds but mm -hmm. But that's yeah. good to hear because I know you are a big music fan, so that uh, that speaks volumes. If you are okay with that that port being a, being away and it hasn't you know damaged your ability to to use your device in that way, then great. No, it it really hasn't. And yeah, believe me, I mean I've been yelling about uh, the faults in in Apple Music, so I do care about uh, audio and music, and I just don't see the big deal in in this part of it. Yeah. Yes, everyone who would say that Jim would never say something negative about Apple um, <laughs> should just go back and search Jim Dalrymple, <laughs> Apple Music. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, so what about the, the uh, AirPods? You tested those out too. Tell us about those. So the AirPods are Apple's uh, wireless headphones. I, I've tried Bluetooth headphones over the years and I just, I can't use them because the sound is so awful so tinny and when it comes right down to it i mean music for me is is about enjoying the music and you know there's there's fidelity in music and a, and and a wideness when you listen to a greatly uh, mixed and mastered song that you know you just you feel the music and bluetooth headsets uh just didn't get any of that i was pleasantly surprised to see that the uh, AirPods have quite a bit of bass in them. The music sounded really good. Not as good as my future Sonics. I never expected them to, but they sound a lot better than what I would have given them credit for going in. Now, it's not only the, the AirPods themselves, it's some of the things that Apple did. For instance, if you have the AirPods in your ears and you're listening to music and you take one out, the music will automatically pause. You put it back in, the music will automatically start playing again. Uh, if you're on a phone call, you can have both of them in and hear stereo. Or if you take one out, it'll switch to mono on the one that's left in, in your ear or switch them around and do the other one. So you can double tap, or if, you're listening, if you're on your iPhone, double tap the AirPod and invoke Siri to ask it a question. Uh, on the watch, if you're playing music from your watch, you can double tap and it'll play pause the music. You know, things like that. I mean, the other day I was listening to a playlist on my uh, watch using the AirPods. I went over and pressed the button to ask Siri a question. The music on my watch paused. The AirPods automatically went to the iPhone. I asked my question, left everything, didn't touch anything. And in, within five seconds, um, Siri closed out, the AirPods connected back to my watch and started playing the song again. And it was all uh, seamless. There was no herky-jerky motions or anything going on. It just, it connected to one, back to the other, played music. And, you know, that's, that's I think, kind of the stuff that we expect from Apple that other companies get away with that we, we allow them to. Did Siri answer your question correctly? She did answer my question. <laughs> she did. Actually, that's something else is interesting to note. I, I found that the uh, uh, the AirPods, the Siri was able to pick up my voice better using the AirPods oh. than just sitting and and speaking. Interesting. So. So you write that uh, in your reviews, you say, I am not a child. I think I can take care of my uh, AirPods um, because everyone's saying they're going to lose them. I'm not a child either, but I do not think I can take care of them. I just really, really believe I would lose those things right away. I know it's just become an internet meme, but how am I going to keep them track of them? <laughs> how, I, don't, I don't know how you wouldn't. I mean, I've had them where I, I put them in the case. And by the way, it took... I ran the AirPods down to zero battery. Uh, they were dead. And it took less than 15 minutes to charge them up to 
So uh, anytime you have a couple of choices, anytime that you have them, um, you can just pop them in the um, in the case and then you know where they are. The second thing yesterday, um, as you know, I was at a, a Giants game yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was wearing the uh, the AirPods when it was time to go into the game, and I met up with uh, a friend of mine. I just took them out and put them in my pocket. It's probably not the smartest thing to do <laughs> is just put them in. But that's what I did. I just put them in my pocket. I knew where they were. When I get home, um, I went outside. I pulled them out of my pocket and popped them back in my ear, and away I went. Well, let's so, move on to the let's move on to the watch, which I can't okay. lose because it's attached to my wrist. Maybe I just need to figure out a way to attach <laughs> them to my ears. Which I guess you also say they do stick stick in your ears, and you're someone like me who's the air, the ear pods fall out of. But the watch, uh, what can you tell us about the new watch? So the watch has uh, GPS now, and to me that's a huge thing because I uh, I lost fifty pounds using the watch and rings and exercise and things like that. So, but I always had my iPhone with me when I was doing that. Uh, because you, you kind of needed, I, I needed the music and I didn't have any good wireless headphones and I wanted to know where I was going and be able to track things as, as best I could. So I always had my phone with me as well. But now I, I it's kind of freeing to leave, purposely leave my iPhone at home, which is not something I do. Uh, often at all, and just go out for a walk, just to have a walk, and you know, be without the iPhone for you know thirty to sixty minutes and and exercise. Um, they also have swimming now, so when when you go in to um, do a, a swimming workout, the iPhone will automatically lock the screen so that there's no accidental taps on the screen. And the GPS knows where you are and your speed because every time you bring your arm out of the water for your stroke, the GPS will know from the satellite where you are. So it will do a map of where you swam or it will keep track of your, your lap times or things like that. Uh, when you're done, you uh, turn the digital crown and it will eject all the water from the speaker area, which is the only place that water can get in on the, the new Apple Watch. So it's it's pretty advanced. I, I really like it. Well, Jim, thank you as always for coming on. Jim Dalrymple is the co-founder of Loop Insight. He's an Apple expert, formerly of lots of Mac places. Thank you so much for coming on. You can also find him on Twitter at jdalrymple. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jim. <laughs> Have a great night. Uh, a viewer who asked to remain anonymous for whatever reason writes in <laughs> about Apple's removal of the headphone jack. We were just talking about it a little bit. He says, it is very frustrating to see folks, including some on your shows, gloss over this huge issue, either dismissing its importance or ignoring it altogether, giving, uh, Apple, giving Apple a pass in their increasing campaign to take advantage of their brand loyalty by becoming more and more anti-consumer and anti-environment year after year. You do your listeners a disservice as a result because you encourage the bad behavior both on the part of Apple as well as the other manufacturers who later follow suit because they see Apple being allowed to get away with it and shifting the perception of what is, quote, acceptable. Uh, how much better would Samsung have been if they could have just sent Note 7 users replacement batteries? I don't know. Yes, I, I would agree that, some you know, we have to hold their, their feet to the fire. I think we've t actually talked a lot on this show about uh, kind of the silliness of removing the headphone jack. So I don't know about that example specifically. We also don't have a whole lot of control over what Samsung chooses to do with their battery. Sure, that would have uh, that would have absolved this particular issue, let's say, but they did that based on decisions that they made about a lot of other things that are inside the phone. Uh, you know, that enabled them to do other things. Same, same, uh, same, you know, excuse comes from Apple. If we get rid of the headphone jack, that allows us to do all of these other things that you're going to like. Is that true? Is that not true? I don't know. That's what they say. And we can only kind of take their word for it, but I don't like losing the headphone jack. And I think that we've talked about that enough on the show. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I think from an environmental perspective, it is, I'm um, important to just imagine how many, you know, headphones are probably going to be thrown away. I mean, there is the dongle, but, you know, a lot of people will just say, like, I'm just going to get a new pair of headphones, you know, so. Or a different phone. Fun. Yes, you know? exactly. No <laughs> like one's forcing options, you to buy the iPhone 7. Yeah, yeah exactly. But you have options, so. You do.
After the break, leaked emails show that it's not all stickers and jet black glossiness at Apple. But first, let's take a minute to thank Wealthfront, the sponsor of this episode. Traditional advisors charge huge fees between 1% and 3% of what they manage. But with Wealthfront, you only pay one quarter of 1% a year. That's 25 basis points, zero commissions, and no hidden fees. That's less than $5 a month to invest a $30,000 account. There are no additional charges for any of Wealthfront's services. Now, Wealthfront has a new portfolio review. You can see if your portfolio portfolio is risk, how diversified your investments are, what you're losing to fees. You can even minimize your taxes and you can get started investing today with as little as $500. It only takes just a few minutes to sign up. It goes right to work. It'll monitor your portfolio around the clock, always, even when you're sleeping, and it will take action as soon as the opportunity arises. Wealthfront is transparent. It's accessible. You can view and track all your accounts in one place. Wealthfront can track both your Wealthfront and your non-Wealthfront bank and your brokerage accounts that they will provide in a summary of all your assets. You can also see every trade that Wealthfront makes on your behalf in your dashboard, on your desktop, or with their mobile app. Wealthfront's process is based on Nobel Prize winning academic research and the best investment practices. Now we've heard from many Twit fans who have used Wealthfront and they love how they can diversify their portfolios and buy stocks from in-demand companies like the companies that we are always talking about Apple, Amazon, Facebook, all commission-free. Wealthfront recently introduced their 529 college savings plan, allowing you to invest after-tax dollars, much like a Roth IRA, and save for your child or your grandchild's higher education expenses. Even if you don't have kids right now, but you plan to have them in the future, it is never ever too early to start thinking about investing. Invest in you and your family's future today with Wealthfront. Visit Wealthfront.com slash TNT to sign up and get your free personalized investment portfolio. You'll see the customized allocation they recommend for your profile. And just for Twit listeners, if you sign up to invest, Wealthfront will manage your first $15,000 entirely free of charge for life. Join the many Twit fans who have seen huge success with Wealthfront and claim your offer today at Wealthfront.com slash TNT. So Apple has made efforts, as many large tech companies have in recent years, to shine a light on its efforts in workplace diversity. But a collection of leaked emails seems to paint a picture of a, quote, toxic work environment for some of its staff. Joining us to talk about this is Melanie Aaron Kranz from Mike. How's it going, Melanie? Hi, thank you for having me. Absolutely, it's great to get you here. So uh, first of all, you were, you were sent a bunch of internal Apple emails that support uh, the piece that you wrote. Explain what led to you receiving that stockpile of information. How did that come about? Sure, so Mike obtained over 50 pages of emails from both current and former Apple employees. And within those emails, you know, it were they were people kind of airing their grievances. We saw examples of workplace harassment, discrimination, um, and hostile work environments. And so we received those recently. And that's kind of what my, my story kind of paints a picture of what was illustrated within these emails. So on, on Friday, last Friday, you published an article about Apple's lack of diversity uh, in their event that they um, they just did announcing the iPhone. Um, and then someone from email from Apple emailed you and they started out with the phrase off the record um, and then proceeded to lay out a whole bunch of stuff. And um, as you pointed out, and as anyone who uh, is a journalist knows that you can't just say off the record and then you have to, like, you would have to have agreed to off the record for that to have actually been off the record. Um, but do you think that is what led to you receiving uh, these emails? Yeah, so actually preceding that story, I, I wrote a story about the lack of diversity specifically on Apple's keynote stage during its iPhone launch event. And, you know, if you look at the numbers, the, the men spoke for over approximately over an hour and a half compared to women who spoke for approximately eight minutes. And so I wrote an article that painted a picture of this keynote and how it lacked that diversity on stage. And the the next story I wrote with that letter from Apple was in response to that story. And so I think it kind of all sparked from, you know, I pointed out this lack of diversity, Apple responded. And again, you know, it was not officially off the record because that requires a prearranged agreement and that, that was not the condition to which this was sent to me. And I think that publishing that email and kind of showing how, you know, a certain point of view that's held within Apple about what diversity is um, and is not 
you know, might have given some people the courage to think that they also can speak out about how their how their experiences are within Apple. Sure. So you um, in your piece, you, you detail a lot of kind of the scenarios, the stories, you know, that are that are shared within these emails. Sounds like um, some of them are, are, you know, represent kind of severe discomfort uh, in, in certain ways. But some of the scenarios actually paint kind of insecurity uh, during late nights. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So, so in one of the emails that was from a former Apple employee and, you know, one of the situations she highlighted that made her uncomfortable was that she was working a late night shift. And she said in this late night shift, she was one of the only females um, working in isolation. She said the nearest person to her was like six rows down and that it was so quiet that these motion sensitive lights would go off. So she felt like she was working in isolation and darkness and as the only woman and she didn't feel safe. And so she brought these concerns to Apple and, you know, she requested at the very least that she be moved to the to the closest person that's working that shift with her so that she wasn't working in such isolation. Um, Apple denied that request and, you know, she was she was fed up and resorted to quitting. Hmm. And then also, like, it's it's easy to kind of get into these, um, you know, these stories and focus just on, let's say, the, the women, the representation of women. But um, inside the emails, you also have kind of examples of men in, in a similar situation, feeling like they were harassed. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, sure. So while, while the emails are predominantly women, there is an instance where a man also felt like he was working in a, in a hostile work environment. He cited harassment as an, is- as an issue. Um, he kind of discussed how his colleagues would make fun of him for being an emotional man. Um, they used the phrase repeatedly that he was on his man period. And, you know, he, he had, you know, in these emails described that as feeling like his colleagues were using these female terms to insinuate that he couldn't effectively do his job and it made him uncomfortable. What, um, um, I mean, so, okay. So we know what we're hearing about, uh, with these emails, but what kind of recourse do the employees have in this scenario? Sure. So as I think a lot of the, the women said in these emails and, you know, some of these emails were to Apple, they, they can take these complaints to management. They can file these complaints. Um, but the issue here was that these women were so frustrated because of a lack of follow-up. Mm-hmm. They had issued these complaints. Um, a few of them resorted to emailing, you know, the CEO, Tim Cook, um, for some type of acknowledgement. So, you know, I think that there's recourse that they can file these complaints, and they did. But that the issue was that they felt that, you know, maybe there was a lack of urgency or that nothing was being taken care of. Or in, in one woman's situation, she filed a complaint and Apple did investigate it. And she said that they did admit to her that she was working in a hostile work environment. And her option that they gave her was that she could stay in this hostile work environment or take a lower level, lower paying job, which is an effective demotion. And, you know, she took, she took the demotion. And so I think a lot of them were, you know, didn't know who to trust. Someone expressed that they didn't know who to trust. They didn't know the right person to go to. And so I think that the issue here is not the ability to file a complaint, but it's, you know, will it actually better their situations? And many of these women did not feel that that was the case. So uh, unfortunately, it's not right, but um, any woman who's been in the workplace has experienced things like this. You just have, and um, you know, it's getting better, I think. Like I've been working since the 90s and you know, it definitely has been getting better. But did you get the sense that this was from a certain team in Apple or was it an entire like toxic culture in Apple? Because obviously it's a huge place, but like we're, most of these emails from a, a certain team, I'm not saying it's right if it just was a certain team, but I'm just wondering if there's like this entire culture of toxicity that we haven't heard about or if it's really just uh, maybe combined to one team? Sure. So, you know, I I can't disclose the specific team that these emails came from, but like what I can say is that all of the individuals within these these threads that were expressing frustration, whether it was discrimination or harassment, were from underrepresented groups within the company, so women and minorities. Um, And I would say that that would be the common thread, that all of these people that were frustrated were were women and minorities. So, you know, Apple, as of its last diversity report is, you know, 32% of its global workforce is women. And so these are the groups that are feeling in these male dominated, you know, companies, they're the ones that were expressing that they, they, 
they didn't feel like that they they had a safe and comfortable work environment to thrive in. So what's next here? What is the next step? They've they've uh, placed their complaints. Um, obviously, you know, a lot of this information is now in the public. Like, what is the next step? Is it just kind of hoping that Apple, this behemoth corporation, makes effective change outwardly? They seem to be, at least on a public sense, they seem to be, you know, uh, releasing the diversity reports and making uh, some sort of a public um, dedication to improving these things. But uh, how does that proliferate internally? Sure. So, you know, Apple Apple did comment. It's in the story. And, you know, they said that they are aware of these instances and they're investigating it um, as far as what happens next, um, what their course of action is. I, I can't tell you that. Um, I don't know that. However, you know, I think that, yes, Apple has been very public about its commitment to, you know, hire more underrepresented groups. And I think that that's great. And I think that they've done a great job. You know, they, they, ha- they have shown that they are aware of their diversity issue as, you know, and it's not exclusive to Apple. This is a Silicon Valley wide issue, um, but it's not, you know, as we're seeing in these emails, these are people that are in the door. They, they work there, they worked there. So it's not an issue of just, okay, we hired, you can hire as many women as you want, but once they get in, if they feel that they're in a hostile work environment, that's not conducive to succeeding or to thriving. And so I think that, yes, continue to focus on, creating a more diverse workforce, but also focus on making sure that this workforce that exists is in place so that they can come in and feel that they're comfortable and safe to thrive and succeed. Yeah, that's it right there. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Melanie. Melanie Aaron Kranz uh, from Mike.com. Where can people follow you online? Thank you. Um, I'm on Twitter. Uh, I think it's right there. Um, so, yeah. That, that's where you can find me. All right, at All right. Melanie Hanna on Twitter. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. <laughs> All right, have a great night. TNT's fan of the day is John Herdman on Twitter, who sent us this snapshot of his setup of an iPad in the living room with a big Jason face on oh. the screen. <laughs> oh, and what is that face that I'm doing right there? <laughs> Don't even understand. Oh, you're talking is... about iPhones again. Oh, boy. <laughs> Show us how you watch or listen to TNT, record a video, or take a picture of yourself or your setup. (laughs) Post it on Instagram, Google Plus, Twitter, or Facebook, and use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT and find the perfect Jason face. Thanks a lot, Kara. (laughs) Blowing that up to be super big on the screen. Uh, Thankfully, you audio listeners didn't have to look at that. Up next, visual proof that we are living in a delicious future. But first, let's take a minute to thank Zerto. They are the sponsor of this episode. Zerto is IT asset protection, disaster recovery, and cloud continuity for confident CIOs. Confidence can make or break businesses uh, in today's IT world. It can mean the difference between hesitation and action, success or irrelevance. Zerto's cloud-based business continuity solutions arm today's CIOs and IT pros with a confidence to know their systems are ready for anything. With Zerto, you can recover from downtime, you can test new technology, move to the cloud in a manner of clicks uh, while maintaining business continuity. Zerto's virtual replication technology gives you the power to simplify your migrations, switch to new infrastructure faster, and get quicker ROI in a matter of clicks. You'll know your data is protected by breakthrough hypervisor-based software that puts the power of continuous replication at your fingertips. You can migrate to the cloud with no disruptions with enterprise class software that empowers you to seamlessly and safely move virtualized workloads between public, private, and hybrid clouds. You'll get complete, comprehensive data protection and one smart solution for BCDR across storage and hypervisors. You can recover from any disruption with checkpoints every few seconds, and you'll protect and recover your files, your virtual machines, your applications from any point in time. See for yourself how Zerto simplifies your data replication and disaster recovery. Plus, you can get a free readiness assessment for your data center at confidentcio.com. That's confidentcio.com. We thank Zerto for their support. So, you know what's old news? The whole Chipotle delivering burritos to students via Google drones thing. You know what's new news? Seeing it with our eyeballs. So we can believe that it's possible. I'm wondering what it would be like if we were the students running out to the middle of a field to grab that drone delivered burrito with the intention of eating it so we aren't quite as hungry anymore. Of course, 
Then we'd also be in school again. And that would mean <laughs> cramming for tests, sharing a dorm room with smelly people, and failing out of racquetball because going to college right out of high school was a bad idea for me. Okay, counselor? You failed, sorry, you I'm failed sorry. racquetball? I flunked out of racquetball. <laughs> That was my sign. That was like my sign that, okay, maybe I don't need to go to uh, college right now. And then I went later. <laughs> but there you go. We've seen it. We've seen it with our own eyes. Yeah. Drone delivers burritos. And, and yeah. Now, yeah. How do well, I know? How, that's true. How do I know this isn't just, you know, all fabricated? A burrito farce? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if whoever, see, okay, we're about to, we're about to experience the joy of picking up a drone delivered burrito from the lawn. It's in a tiny little tent. It's all the way over there. This is kind of like a uh, video of, of um, what is Bigfoot? You yeah. Know, it's super far away, but I believe, I believe that you it's believe. a burrito. I believe I believe that burrito can fly. I believe that burrito can touch the sky. I think about it every night and day. That burrito okay. just never mind. That's the way I want my burritos delivered. On a poker chip. To, with tweezers. <laughs> Thank you for bringing this back down to earth, Megan. Uh, <laughs> D&D records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 11 p.m. UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can be a part of the show by emailing us. That's TNT at twit.tv. You can leave us a short voicemail. That's 260-TNT-SHOW. And you can find us on Twitter. We're at Tech News Today TV. You can find all the ways to subscribe to this burrito drone loving show mm -hmm. at twit.tv slash TNT. And if you want to tweet at me, I'm at Megan Maroney. And I'm at Jason Howell on Twitter. Thanks to our technical director, Kara Cole. Thanks to Burke for scrolling words and helping out with all sorts of other things. And Kevin for editing and making us look good, mostly. And thanks to you for talking tech with us today. We'll see you all tomorrow. Bye, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>